years ago on a cold night on the train, in a train station in Japan. I heard a tap on my, the window of my sleeper car. There stood a freezing boy wearing a ragged shirt with a dirty rag tied about the swollen jaw. His head was covered with scabies. He held a rusty tin can and a spoon, the symbol of an orphan beggar. As I struggled to open the door to give him money, the train pulled out. I will never forget that starving little boy left standing in a cold, holding up an empty tin can. Nor can I forget how helpless I felt as the train pulled slowly away and left him standing on the platform. Some years later in Cusco, a city high in the Andes, Peru, A. Theodore Tuttle and I held a sacrament meeting in a long, narrow room that opened onto the street. It was a cold night, and uh, while Elder Tuttle spoke, a tiny little boy, perhaps six years old, appeared in the doorway. He wore only a ragged shirt that went about to his knees. On her left was a small table with a plate of bread for the sacrament. This starving street orphan saw the bread and ate slowly along the wall toward it. He was almost to the table when a woman on the aisle saw him. With a stern toss of her head, she banished him out into the night. I groaned within myself. Later, the little boy returned. He slid along the wall, glancing from the bread to me. And when he was near the point for the woman to see him again, I held out my arms. He came running to me. I held him on my lap. Then there's something symbolic. I set him on Elder Tuttle's chair. After the closing prayer, the hungry little boy darted out into the night. When I returned home, I told President Spencer W. Kimball about my experience. He was deeply moved and told me you were holding a nation on your lap. He said to me more than once, that experience has far greater meaning than you have yet come to know. As I have visited Latin American countries nearly a hundred times, I have looked for that little boy in the faces of the people. Now I do know what President Kimball meant. I met another shivering boy on the streets of Salt Lake City. It was late on another cold winter night. We were leaving Christmas dinner at a hotel. Down the street came six or eight noisy boys. All of them should have been at home and out of the cold. One boy had no coat. He bounced about, about very rapidly to stave off the chill. He disappeared down the side street, no doubt to a small, shabby apartment and a bed that did not have enough covers to keep him warm. At night, when I pull the covers over me, I offer a prayer for those who have no warm bed to go to. I was stationed in Japan at Osaka when the world, world War II closed. The city was rubble, and the street was littered with blocks and debris and bomb craters. Although most of the trees had been blasted away, some few of them still stood with shattered limbs and trunks and had the courage to send forth a few twigs with leaves. A tiny girl dressed in a ragged colored kimono was busily gathering yellow sycamore leaves into a bouquet. The little child seemed unaware of the devastation that surrounded her as she scrambled over the rubble to add new leaves to her collection. She had found the one beauty left in her world. Perhaps I should say she was the beautiful part of her world. Somehow to think of her increased my faith. Embodied in the child was hope. Mormon taught that little children are alive in Christ and need not repent. Around the turn of the century, Two missionaries were laboring in the mountains of southern United States. One day from a hilltop, they saw people gathering in a clearing far below. The missionary did not often have many people to whom they might preach, so they made their way down to the clearing. 
The little boy had drowned. There was to be a funeral. His parents had sent for the minister to say words over their son. The missionary stood back as the itinerant ministry faced the grieving father and mother and began his sermon. If the parents expected to receive comfort from this man of the cloth, they'd be disappointed. He scolded them severely for not having had that little boy baptized. They'd put it off because of one thing or another, and now it was too late. He told them very bluntly that the little boy had gone to hell, and it was their fault. They were to blame for his endless torment. After the sermon was over and the grave was covered, the elders approached the grieving parents. We are servants of the Lord, they told the mother, and we have come with a message for you. As the sobbing parents listened, the two elders read from the revelations and bore their testimony of the restoration of the keys of redemption of both the living and the dead. I have some sympathy for that preacher. He was doing the best he could with such light and knowledge as he had. But there's more that he should have been able to offer. There's the fullness of the gospel. The elders came as comforters, as teachers, as servants of the Lord, as authorized ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. These children of whom I spoke represent all of our Heavenly Father's children. Children are an heritage of the Lord, and happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. The creation of life is a great responsibility for a married couple. It is a challenge of mortality to be a worthy and responsible parent. Neither man nor woman can bear children alone. It was meant that children have two parents, both a father and a mother. No other pattern or process can replace this one. Long ago, a woman tearfully told me that as a college student, she had made a serious mistake with her boyfriend. He had arranged for an abortion. In due time, they graduated and were married and had several other children. She told me how tormented she now was to look at her family, her beautiful children, and see in her mind the place empty now where the one child was missing. If this couple understands and applies the atonement, they will know that those experiences and the pain connected with them can be erased. No pain will last forever. It is not easy. But life was never meant to be either easy or fair. Repentance and the lasting hope that forgiveness brings will always be worth the effort. Another young couple cheerfully told me that they had just come from a doctor where they were told that they would be unable to have children of their own. They were brokenhearted with the news. They were surprised when I told them that they were actually quite fortunate. They wondered, why would I say such a 